will be working with the handout. OK, um, when I explain my project to other people, I often do so in fairly, gen fairly general terms. I'll say something, oh, I'm interested in the ethical dimensions of ritualized activity. But um, really, what's going on here is that I'm not, I'm not interested in ritualized activity as such, but in particular in ritualized activity as one finds it in the, uh, the liturgical life of the Eastern Christian churches, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, and not um, ethical dimensions in the abstract, but the way in which this activity contributes to the formation and sustenance of certain kinds of ethical character traits. Um, Becky Stengel asked me <laughs> uh, during one of the sessions, well, what is this, a theology or is it a philosophy? And my response was, it's, well, it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, she didn't like that response too much, but I kind of think of it as um, uh, philosophy of liturgy meets moral philosophy. And uh, you can make of it of you will, what you will, but it's definitely off the beaten path as far as philosophy goes. And I think even as theology goes. So what I'm going to do is give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the things that I've been thinking about. Uh, one of the projects in a series of papers that I've been working on. Okay, my, my theme is the, the role of liturgical reenactment. Um, so if you were to step into just about any Christian liturgy, you would find the assembled reading and listening to scriptural presentations of various events that compose the core Christian narrative. And if you were to walk into uh, the performance of one of the more ancient Christian liturgies, in particular the Eastern Christian liturgies, you would f also find uh, the assembled reading and listening to the scriptural depiction of events of the core Christian narrative. But what you would also find at various points is that the assembled reenact some of these events in the context of the liturgy. So for example, if you were to go to some of the, the services in Holy Week or the Lenten uh, period, you would find uh, the assembled reading and listening to various depictions of the events that surrounding Jesus' death. Then at various points, the readers and listeners become performers and perform actions such as uh, uh, that imitate Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet or uh, the burial of Jesus. Um, so something, something interesting is going on here. My, my leading question is, well, why? What's going on here? Um, why, would, why would these liturgical scripts direct the participants to go beyond reading and listening to actually performing uh, some of the event types that are presented in the or Christian narrative. Um, when I ask this question, I'm not primarily interested in sort of causal or historical explanations as to why the liturgy has taken the shape that it has. What I'm really interested in is uh, the, the question that the activity of liturgical reenactment makes to the moral and spiritual life. I'm asking what it's for. Now, I don't want to make the assumption that there's some one purpose for which liturgical reenactment reenactment is for. I don't think that's right. But I still think we can uh, speak intelligibly of dominant ends um, of liturgical reenactment. And what I want to suggest is that among these dominant ends is the construction in the context of liturgical activity of a narrative identity. Um, a word about this, by an agent's narrative identity, I have in mind some event-like thing to which an agent might refer were that agent accurately to tell uh, a story of her life as the agent does the subject. So um, if I were to ask you, well, who are you? What, what made you who you are? What do you care about? And you tell me a story that goes something like, well, it was my love of music that led me to become a professional cellist. In, the mean, in order to do that, I was required to um, uh, surrender a promising uh, career in dance. Well, I'm getting a feel for your narrative identity when you begin to tell me this. Um, lots of caveats here I'm going to uh, shunt to the side uh, about uh, the form that a narrative identity might take. We can talk about that in the Q&A if necessary. Um, now in focusing on the, or at least talking about the topic of narrative identity, I realize that I'm joining a much larger conversation about these things. Um, what I do want to say at the outset, however, is this, that I'm not primarily interested in exploring the descriptive claim that uh, uh, liturgical reenactment makes certain sorts of contributions to the formation and sustenance of character traits. Rather, I'm interested in the normative claim. I'm interested in the sort of commitments that participants in the liturgy undertake when they engage in liturgical reenactment. I hope this will come out clear, especially at the end of my talk, what I've got in mind. So I'm primarily interested in a normative issue. There may be interesting empirical or descriptive issues in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, 
Uh, one more qualification. I'm going to be talking about the Eastern Orthodox liturgies, but I'm really, I've got the Lenten liturgies in my sights. That's primarily what I'm interested in. These liturgies are extremely penitential. So um, it, when, I, when it comes to the point where I read some of the texts, so you, you have to keep this in mind. This is a very penitential period in the liturgical life of the church. Okay. So let me begin by saying just a bit more about the activity of liturgical reenactment. I got so absorbed by this topic at one point that I dedicated one of my papers to exploring what it is, engaging with theologians and the like. So I've got a longer story to tell here. But I want to at least um, give you a feel for how I'm thinking about it. Uh, to my mind, it takes two primary forms. Um, one form it can take is when the assembled imitate and repeat actions that are presented in the core Christian narrative. So for example, um, the assembled might uh, imitate and repeat the action of Jesus as washing his disciples' feet. Another form that liturgical reenactment can take is that of imitating act, act types that are presented in the narrative, but not repeating them, uh, but using certain kinds of props. Uh, so for example, uh, in the Holy Friday liturgy, um, the assembled reenact the burial of Jesus, but they don't have an actual tomb and they don't have the body of Jesus there, so what they use is uh, props of various sorts, including um, an icon to, to stand in for, for Jesus. So that would be another form of liturgical reenactment. As you'll see, um, I'm very interested in liturgical reenactment that takes the form of imitating and repeating speech acts that are part of the core Christian narrative. Okay, that, that'll come out more clearly, I hope, as well. Um, I wanna also draw attention to a striking feature of liturgical reenactment. Many of the actions that are reenacted are fictive. They're, act, they're actions taken by fictional characters. The publican, the prodigal. Moreover, some of the other actions that are taken are uh, 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 imitations of actions that are taken by characters that the scriptural texts don't present as fictional, but nevertheless, the scriptural texts don't present these characters as having performed those actions. Instead, what we get is the liturgical script embellishing upon the scriptural narrative and putting words in the mouth of Mary of Bethany and Mary of Theotokos and Jesus and so on and so forth, and it's these fictive actions that get reenacted. Now this raises a question immediately, at least for me. What's going on? Is this a matter of play acting? Is this make-believe? Is this pretense? Is this a whole bunch of role playing that's going on in the liturgy? Uh, I'm going to offer you a reason later on um, for, for, for holding no. The answer is, is, is this is not a, a species of make-believe in which I pretend to be Mary Theotokos or in which I pretend to be present in my own person that Jesus is washing of the feet. Okay. What I want to say instead is something like this is going on. Um, think about a common experience of reading a work that presents a narrative, um, a novel, say. Uh, it seems to me a common experience is that we immerse ourselves in the novel without pretending to be the characters or without pretending to be present at the events that are depicted in the narrative. We immerse ourselves in the sense that the characters loom large in our consciousness and we become emotionally involved in, in various sorts of ways with the characters. We get absorbed by the story, but without, as it were, engaging in pretense. So what I want to say is that liturgical reenactment should be understood as uh, a mode of imaginative engagement with the narrative that is not a matter of make-believe, it's not a matter of pretense. One further qualification. The further qualification is I'm not really sure uh, what people are actually doing when they celebrate the liturgy. What I want to claim is that this is the sort of response that the liturgical script calls forth. Okay, no matter how many people actually conform to what it is that the liturgical script is calling for. Okay, so, uh, so far I've tried to give you a sense of my leading question, how I'm thinking about the activity of liturgical reenactment. Now we need to make a little bit more progress on um, the question of what liturgical reenactment is for, the sorts of contributions it makes to the moral and religious life. So let me work with, um, um, a comparison I just used, and that's with reading. So some of you are probably familiar with Martha Nussbaum's work, and in particular this collection of essays that she published some time ago, Love's Knowledge. She makes some rather interesting claims uh, I I in the context of this book. And what she claims is that literature has a distinctive contribution to make to the moral life. Um, what it does is present us with rich and nuanced descriptions of characters and their often complicated predicaments 
such that we expand and deepen our moral understanding in various ways. And what she says is literature is especially suited to do this. I mean, she primarily has novels in mind. It's not literature as such. She primarily, primarily has novels in mind. Literature is especially suited to do this. Philosophy, by contrast, is not very well suited to do this. We can offer you analyses of various sorts of virtues, but um, what philosophy doesn't do is offer a narrative presentation of a virtue such that we can follow its development over time and learn skills um, in, such, in such a way that we can learn to better um, identify the virtue where we see it in ordinary life. And I might add, ordinary life often doesn't present us with very good opportunities to, to track virtues in the way that narratives present us um, with the virtues. Okay, so, so Nussbaum's claims that literature has a distinctive contribution to make to our moral understanding. And one of the thoughts I had was, well, you know, maybe that's what's going on with the liturgical script as well and liturgical participation. It's for the expansion, the deepening of um, moral understanding. But uh, one thing to note here is that when the liturgical script presents us with narratives, and it does present us with narratives, what it really does is present us with little snapshots of characters. And it doesn't really follow these characters through time in the way that a novel does. Moreover, the, the script uh, presupposes an intimate um, familiarity with uh, the scriptural narrative, such that it's, it's presupposing you, you've got to draw on all this stuff that's already in the background in order to, to figure out what's going on. So my question was, if, if, if what's going on in liturgical reenactment is not exactly like what's going on when we le read literature, what exactly is going on? How, how should we understand uh, the way it's working upon us or the way it ought to work upon us if we were to react in such a way that the, um, the liturgical script calls forth? So what I want to claim is that um, there's a clue um, that we ought to pay attention to. And uh, this I'm on uh, uh, the the top of three in the, the handout. Here I'm going to read some text, so it's good to have that before us. I want to say that the clue lies in what I'm going to call the self-reflective character of the liturgical script. The liturgical script has, did I say reflective? Self-reflexive character of the liturgical script. It has the unusual feature of casting much of its hymnody and a lot of the text in the first person. And I think this technique is used in three different, although compatible ways. So um, let me try to give you examples of each. One way it uses um, uh, the first person indexical is by recasting stories in the first person, stories that were not originally presented in the first person. So for example, at one point in the liturgical script, you have Adam, the character Adam, uh, Speaking in the first person, the Lord my creator took me as dust from the earth and formed me into a living creature, breathing into me the breath of life and giving me a soul. He honored me, making me companion of the angels. In my wretchedness, I have cast off the robe woven by God and am clothed now in fig leaves and garments of skin. Those of you who are familiar with the Genesis narrative realize that they're taking liberties with the text. They're putting it in the first person, which I think is kind of interesting if I'm right to say this is not a matter of role playing. Um, what exactly is going on is, is not entirely clear. Here's another uh, example of using or a way in which the first person is used. Uh, I call it on your handout indexical appropriation, where it's not a matter of presenting stories in the first person, but taking stories with first personal <coughs> elements and having the assembled appropriate them by quoting them. So uh, here I read some passages. Let us emulate the groaning of the publican and speaking to God with warm tears, let us cry out. O oh, you who loves humankind, we've sinned in your compassion and, and, and pity. Be merciful and save. Like the thief, I cry out to you, remember me. Like Peter, I weep bitterly. Like the publican, I call out, forgive me, Savior. Like the harlot, I shed tears. Like the woman of Canaan, I cry to you, have mercy on me, son of David. Like the woman with an issue of blood, I touch the hem of your garment. I weep as Martha and Mary wept for Lazarus. I'm going to say a few more things about these passages and the, the, the functions that they're playing in a moment. And then finally, a third way in which the first person uh, indexical is used is what I call comparative self-address. Now, if you think about it, use of the first person isn't so unusual when it indicates who it is that's doing the addressing. It's me, not you, right, that, when I use a first person indexical. But it, it is rather interesting, I think, when the first person indexical is used in such a way that it indicates who is the object of address. And I think that's what's going on here. A um, couple passages again. 
I am become the prodigal son, and having wasted my riches, I perish now from hunger. Beneath your protection, I seek refuge. Accept me as you accepted him. I'm going to the second passage. I am the prodigal conceived in sin. I dare not look up to the heights of heaven, but trusting in your love for humankind, I cry out, God be merciful to me and save me. Okay, new question. Why, I've, I've, I've said this is a clue to understanding what's going on, but, but what's the clue pointing us to? Uh, how are we to understand this? I want to make one caveat before I uh, offer what I take to be a diagnosis of what's going on. And the caveat is this, and I'd like to, to explore this in more, more detail. But um, as philosophers of language have pointed out, uh, <laughs> the first person indexical is, is, a, is a unique thing. Uh, the content that it picks out all depends on who's, who's using it. So it may be that when I say, I am the prodigal, I'm saying something rather differently, rather different from when, say, Christian says, I am the prodigal. Um, that's, that's the sort of fluidity that you get built into the text by use of the first uh, person indexical here. Um, so I, I was thinking about this. I've got character in three senses operative. I've got fictional characters, Kaplanian character, and now <laughs> ethical character. Anyway, um, so lots of character. <laughs> uh, at any rate, so here, here's a diagnosis that I, that I want to, to try to develop a little bit. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm hazarding some generalizations here. Suppose you and I are very, very different. You're a felon, convicted felon. I'm not. Or you're a conspirator with an oppressive foreign power, and I'm not. Now, suppose uh, it, it comes to be that we need to work together in some sort of way. We need to accomplish some goal. Um, what are some of the techniques that I might use in order to accomplish a goal in which we're talking about people with, in which there's considerable psychological distance, differences in history, difference in temperament, difference in way of, of seeing things? Well, here's w w one, one thing I might do. I might try to close the psychological distance between us by trying to see things from your perspective, taking on your perspective, um, in this case, a first-person perspective. Or I might try to identify with you. Uh, I might find, I might attempt to locate points of similarity between you and I where these points of similarity can be the basis of mutually enjoyed recognition or lasting social bonds or unified action together. Such as when you and I discover, boy, we're both really interested in chamber music. Let's, let's begin to share music and perform music together. Okay. So here's, here's the thought that I want to float. That what's going on with the use of the first person indexical is the attempt, what's, what it's calling forth is an attempt to close psychological distance and to identify with the characters in question. Um, if you look at the passage that I just read, uh, past this, the second set of passages, um, where it says, like the thief I cry to you, like Peter I weep bitterly, like pu the publican I call out to you, it seems pretty clear that the script is presenting us with a cast of characters um, that are such that there is considerable psychological distance between us and them, or at least most of us and them. After all, we have thieves, we have betrayers, we have conspirators with oppressive foreign powers, we have prostitutes. The woman of Canaan is hysterical. She's, she's sort of out of her mind. Um, uh, uh, the woman with the issue of blood is infirm in, 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 in sort of the way it's presented in uh, biblical term, unclean. Um, and what we're asked to do here is identify with these characters. Um, two interesting points I want to, to bring out here. One point is the self-constituting nature of performing the speech acts in question. By imitating and repeating, that is performing the very same speech act that the script attributes to the thief, or the publican, or the woman of Canaan. You thereby bring it about that you have a point of similarity. You thereby bring it about that there is an identification of a, of a certain kind. Bring about. This is what I'm referring to the self -con as the self-constituting nature of the liturgy. Uh, the second thing I want to note is that the identification is, it's, 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 I think it's striking. I mean, what's going on here is that the script is inviting men to in identify with characters who are women, women who are characters who are men, thieves to, or innocent people to identify with thieves, uh, non-conspirators, the faithful to identify with conspirators, those who are um, not particularly sexually promiscuous to identify with prostitutes. It's, 
there is a real expansion of, of, of identifications going on here. And I, I was sort of like a destabilization. If you, had a, if you had a view of yourself that you were comfortable with, this is a way to shake things up quite a bit. And yet at the same time, I think there's a unifying function going, in there, going on here in as much as it's also calling those who are participating in the liturgy to unify around certain kinds of ideals. What sorts of ideals? Well, one, one ideal I think that is being presented is something like, we don't have it all together. These people didn't have it all together. You probably don't either. And the ideal of repentance being extraordinarily important to the moral life. So you can see, as I see, the sort of destabilization characteristic and uh, this unifying characteristic. Okay. But at the outset of my talk, I said, uh, I'm interested in something even stronger than this. I'm, I'm interested in the project uh, or the question of whether participating in the liturgy um, is also a process whereby an agent constructs a narrative identity. And I think it's pretty easy to see that um, right off the bat that identifying with someone is not as such to identify with that person in such a way that the identification forms part of one's narrative identity. You know, you and I can identify in certain ways in our love for a particular type of music, but when I tell my story accurately, that's not going to figure into the story. I think something more robust is going on here. So in these texts in which the, the liturgical script instructs the participants to, to say, I am the prodigal son, I am the prodigal, I take it that what we have here is something like, you are to identify with this person to the degree that this person's story, this person's narrative is now also part of your narrative, part of your story. That's, it's supposed to be, I think, that intimate. Um, uh, I think there even might be a sense in which by performing these speech acts in the context of the liturgy, it might be that you're actually narrating your own personal identity within the context of the liturgy. When you actually say these things, you're, you're in the process of constructing it, which is kind of interesting. It's not like you go home and begin to think about, there you are, on the ground, doing it. Okay. So um, that, I think, this, these, this cluster of considerations, I think, is what the liturgical script is primarily interested in eliciting from its participants by its use of the first person indexical. So my, one of the main questions I asked at the outset was, well, what contribution does liturgical reenactment make to the moral and religious life? And I've suggested that it lies with closing of psychological distance, identifying with characters to the point in which these characters get woven into one's own narrative identity. But I said I also wanted to resist descriptive claims, that this is actually what happens most of the time or some of the time or anything like that. Um, let me say a little bit more about this. I've stopped short of making these descriptive claims because I'm interested in a normative thesis or articulating a normative thesis. The thesis that I want to articulate is actually doubly normative, and here's why. Um, I want to say it's normative on one level because what I'm interested in, as I indicated earlier, is what it is that the liturgical script calls forth from us. Right? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a normative relation of a certain kind. What I'm also interested in is the type of speech acts that participants in the liturgy perform. So when you say, I am the prodigal, or uh, like the publican, I, I repent, or whatever, you, there you are performing these speech acts in the context of the liturgy. And what I want to say is what's distinctive of speech acts is that in performing a given speech, performing a given speech act, you put yourself on the hook in a certain way. You lay down a certain kind of commitment. So if I were to tell you right now, look, I've just been um, elected provost of the University of Vermont. I've just put, and sincerely, and you know, I've put myself on the hook in such a way that if that's not true, you're entitled to correct me, maybe admonish me. Or if I don't believe it, you're correct, you're, you, you've got the right to correct me. So I think what's going on in large measure in these liturgical texts is that what they're calling forth is commitments of various kinds on the parts of those who participate in it. Uh, I also want to know, as sort of a side note, it, it's communal. It, it's a sort of commitment in which you know that your neighbor is, is being called to do the same thing and you see that she's called to do the same thing and she sees that you're doing the same thing or called to do the same thing. So I think there's a, a level of mutual recognition going on here in its communal nature too. 
Um, uh, at any rate, it's this, this normative feature that I want to, to call attention to as being absolutely at the center of the liturgy. And this is one of the central reasons why I think that liturgical reenactment is not about role playing. It's not about pretense. It's not about make believe. Because if you or I were acting and reading our lines in the context of performing a play or some sort of performing art, we're not committing ourselves to anything. <laughs> if I'm performing a play and I say, look, I've just been elected provost of UVM, you, you can't hold me accountable. There's no interesting sense in which I put myself on the hook. But if I'm right to say that a primary function of the liturgy is normative and that we're making commitments of various kinds to which we may most of the time fall short, um, What's going on here is not pretense. It's, it's not make-believe. Um, OK. Uh, I'm good. There's lots more to say about all these topics. I'm going to end with that. Okay. Great talk, Terrence. Thanks. The one thing that I thought was missing was the notion that in the liturgy, uh, one function, my major function I take, is the calling forth of the presence of God among the community of the believers. And when the believers um, reenact the liturgy, they thereby put themselves in the presence of God or, or elicit God's presence among them. And this, it seems to me, has a transformative effect on what they do. Uh, so I want to get your opinion on that and on how that plays into this. I mean, I, I certainly agree that this is not role-playing. Um, Although a lot of theologians seem to be attracted to that thesis. I, I think they're wrong. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't think yeah. that's a rich enough description of what's going on. Uh -huh. But, you know, the believers in this, in this reenactment, I mean, they're believing that God, they are encountering God here. They have an encounter with God. And so how does that transform their narrative? Um, so I guess that's my question. What? It's a good question. It's a, it's a fair question. Um, uh, I think the dynamic that you're pointing to is very much part of the self-understanding of, um, say, how the Eastern Christians view the liturgy. That in some sense, they've put themselves in the, the flow of divine energy, however you want to talk about that. Um, Eastern Christians like to th talk in terms of divine energies. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess what I want to say is that seems to me compatible with what I'm saying. Uh, it's not what I've had my eye on in this talk, um, but I'd be certainly interested in thinking about it more. Um, so maybe I should have added a further caveat. I'm, I'm exploring part of what's going on with liturgical reenactment, but don't um, take myself to be uh, mining its, rich, its, its riches. And, and, and you've definitely pointed to another dimension that I think needs to be taken account of. Yeah. Well, yes. <coughs> that was very interesting. I love you much. I was interested in trying to understand the nature of this commitment that they're being asked to make. Yeah. A little bit better. And it sounded like it had something to do with recreating their identity, their narrative identity. Yep. And, it was, and, and so I was wondering, I was trying to think, are, are they being asked to, to so like the thief, like how do you remember me? Are they yeah. being asked to remember that they were one time a thief calling out to God, remember me? Yeah. Or is it something like that? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That so here, here I want to try to take advantage of the fluidity of uh, the indexical here. So um, uh, if I have thief-like elements in my history, <laughs> you can easily see how it is that I can appropriate those words. If I don't have thief-like elements of the, like this in my history, it, it, it may be that uh, these speech acts are, are functioning in such a way that they're prompts for me to engage in deeper self-reflection, to figure out ways in which I am like the thief and, uh, and need to recognize that. So you know, once again, if I've been a wastrel for you know, 30 years or whatever, the, the sentence, I am the prodigal, may have a lot of import for me. But if I'm like Christian who has not been a wastrel, uh, you know, it may be that what's being called forth is I've got to engage in some careful self-examination to the effect that I'm finding points of, of similarity between the prodigal uh, and me. And, and I, what I think is kind of interesting about this is that what we're being called to do is really expand our self-conceptions in such a way that um, um, 
we've got to try to see ourselves in ways and in the light that we're not accustomed to seeing ourselves. Um, um, there, there are pitfalls here too. You know, I really haven't talked about the pitfalls here, but you know, uh, <laughs> um, identifying with uh, characters that in ways that aren't healthy, right? That could certainly happen. So I think this is. It's not like this. This whole enterprise is not fraught with with some some moral risk to to use uh, Becky's terminology. I think it is, um, and I don't have any pat answers as to how a participant in the liturgy would navigate uh, unhealthy sorts of identifications because I think that could definitely happen. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Uh, I'm not sure this is a real concern because you said, well, sometimes you talk about these, uh, the, the kind of use of the index colas constructing an identity yep. or constituting an identity, but almost all the cases I can think of, it's kind of revealing an identity. And sometimes you use that word too. So when, at, can I go Western for a second? Or is that the use? <laughs> Didn't you see the sign out there? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe it's the same. Uh, so when, uh, during the passion, you know, the crowd, the people in the congregation say, crucify him, crucify yeah. him, we have no king but Caesar. Yeah. You're realizing that in your comfortable middle-class life, and you couldn't imagine doing such a thing. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what you probably would have done in, yeah. in that situation. Right. So it's not it's not thinking of yourself as you know, constructing an identity as a first per, first century Roman yeah. or something. Yeah. But <clears throat> seeing that that's there's that similarity. There. Yeah. Uh, I think I want to say two things to that. Uh, the first thing I want to say is. Um, there is quite a bit that could be going on when one uses these indexicals. I've pointed to what I take to one of the be one of the dominant ends. I don't. I don't want to claim it's the only end. Um, so what what you've got your finger on, maybe have going on as well. But it also strikes me that it, it might be that it's important for us to incorporate into our narrative identities certain sort of <laughs> um, uh, how to put this counterfactual type stuff uh, to the effect that yeah I'm the one that did this and did that, but I'm also the one that probably would have done this. Had I been there, um, and that may make uh, a great deal of difference in how you interact with other people and the ways in which you hold them accountable and how you view yourself. So, I, I don't, I don't think it's incompatible with being an important part of one's narrative identity to have these sort of counterfactual type type of elements in them. Can you come back to me? The question is still sort of half baked. So we can have a um, hi, Terrence. Um, hi, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I just have a uh, comment. I was wondering why you thought about it. Uh, it seems to me that there's uh, a third layer of normativity to uh, the liturgical acts. And Good, I like normativity. The more the better. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps even more important than, than, than the first two that you pointed out, which is the normative commitment of God. Uh, it, through the performance of the liturgical act. So, so uh, it's common that in our liturgical act, uh, um, the priest or the minister speaks on behalf of God. Like, for instance, uh, in the forgiveness of sin, the pronouncements of forgiveness of sin. Yep. Uh, so, in this case, uh, God is making a commitment through the actions of the priest or the ministers. And it seems that this normativity e even overshadows whatever human uh, normative uh, commitment that is made, and it's in light of the normative commitment that God makes that human beings respond to this primary divine commitment that's being made, and 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 gives it a uh, primary substance. I was wondering what you thought about. Um, so let me let me follow up with a query. So do you think that that's a that's a natural way to construe what I've what I'm talking about when I pick out these these examples of liturgical commitment, or liturgical reenactment, rather. I mean, I, I see the dynamic that you're referring to. I'm just wondering whether you think yeah. the dynamic that you've referred to is present in, or sort of on, you can detect it in, in what I've been talking about as cases of liturgical reenactment. 
Oh, uh, yeah, um, okay. yeah, but but uh, but it seems that your focus is more on the human side. Yeah, the human. That's right. Uh, yeah, this this is right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But it seems that in a lot of the church liturgy, that uh, it's designed in such a way that there's a kind of dialogue between God and yeah. man. so so the minister say certain things sure. on behalf of God, and then uh, the congregation will respond in, in a certain way. So 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 there is a so God is making normative commitments. Uh, uh, human beings are responding. Uh, by making certain non non uh -huh. and and the human response is in a way um, um, uh, founded upon this primary commitment on God's part. So so the human response is in a way secondary. God's commitment is primary, and then human right on this primary commitment that God has made. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm going to offer you uh, an answer similar to the answer I offered to Nancy, and it's somewhat evasive in the sense that I, I think what I say is compatible with, with what you're suggesting. Um, it's simply that I've had my sights on certain dynamics that are present in the liturgy um, and felt like I've had my hands full to just think about that. Um, uh, I would like to see a smooth way of incorporating what you're talking about into the activity of liturgical reenactment, not just activity of the liturgy. But I think I'm going to have to think about that more, um, whether there's a sort of extra normative layer and that gives us insight into what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's baked. You're, you're, what with your holly. I put myself on the hook. What were those little, baked, what were those little <laughs> ovens? Uh, the holly something baked. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, quick two part thanks, and then a, the question. So, um, two part thanks is, um, I think this is, it's helpful. The paper's particularly helpful in thinking of philosophy of religion. Not, at, it's not merely about M and E, but also about oh. ethics and aesthetics. So, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, felt, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think it's just a benefit of the paper. Okay. And, um, and I think it's the, I like the way Indexes sort of bring out the sort of uses of language, like the indexical appropriation. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's someone I think when reading Descartes' meditation, but if you don't pay attention to the fact that the, he's using the first person indexical, yeah. there's a there's a there's a significance of that literary genre. Right? Yeah. If you don't recognize that, you miss the book. Yeah, yeah. Right? This is part of it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important the stuff that's going on in the paper general. So here's the question after saying some nice things. Um, <laughs> uh, this is, this is someone who actually knows the Eastern Orthodox <laughs> <laughs> tradition. So, yep. so this like um, the significance is, as it's described in the paper, are, are things that are going on in me, and so say Nate and I are the liturgy, and yep. things that are going on in me in relationship to Nate, yep. that seems right. Yep. It seems that there are two other things, I don't know if you want to say something about them. Yep. Right? So the, in the text, even the ones you cite, there's always a, it looks like there's always a sort of connection to what's going on between me and God. Yep. Right? So, there's a, so there's one thing, what's going on between me and Nate, you seem to address that. Yep. I'm wondering if you do or want to think about what's going on between me and God, yep. that's the second thing. I think the third thing is, what's uh, what's going on between me and God and Nate, right? So I think there's yeah. a way in which I, in in coming to a deeper love and care for Nate, uh, uh -huh. I, I might be I might be loving God in, by and insofar as I'm loving Nate, and I might be loving uh, Nate insofar as I'm loving God because of the relationship we share. So I want to keep going to about those two other aspects there. Okay, so this this comment is of a piece with Nancy's, and sorry, I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, And it seems right. It seems seems as if the uh, the speech acts that are performed, which purport to address God, um, that's important, and that shouldn't drop out. So I'll just give you a promissory note, I guess, at this point that I need I need to think a little bit more about how that's supposed to fit in with the sorts of things that I've been talking about, and in, in terms of the transformation of the self. Um, but at least we can say this, we can say something about the construction of an, 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 a, a narrative identity is going to have uh, uh, elements that make essential reference to divine activity. Yeah, yeah that's, the sort, that's the sort of identity that's being called forth by the script. At the very least, that's a very abstract way of putting it, but, but yeah, so I, I'm the one that has not only repented, but the one who has been forgiven or whatever it might be. Mike. Uh, thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, could you just say something about what you, how you understand what's necessary um, in the participants in the liturgy for the calling forth to work 
in the way it's supposed to work. Uh, so do you, do you have thoughts about whether there's something like uh, like the virtues of a good reader that yeah. correspond to yeah, that's great, that's a great question. some kind of disposition? Mm -hmm. and, and partly I'm related to that, um, what sort of commitments, uh, like Christian or Eastern Christian commitments, do you think you already have to need to bring to the table for the liturgy to work, or do you think you could also work at moving someone to those commitments, yeah, yeah. and just acting from them? Yeah. So that's sort of set. Of yeah, yeah, that's, inter that's 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 a good question. I've asked myself on certain occasions. Um, um, so let me speak uh, autobiographically just for a moment. So as a regular participant in uh, the Eastern liturgies, what I found is that it's really hard. <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of concentration. I mean, you're there for hours standing. You know, it's, it's, it's not like this is not a game for you know, the faint of heart. Uh, so there's a sense in which I think what the liturgical script calls forth, uh, if we actually conform to it, that requires a lot of effort on it for the most part. Uh, on, on our part. And it's going to take a lot of practice and habituation and training. So not only is it going to require a lot of familiarity with the scriptural narrative, it's, it requires a lot of attention as, as you participate in the liturgy and familiarity. So one thing that's worth mentioning is that these liturgies come at you again and again and again and again. So you get plenty of opportunities to, to, to practice, as it were. But it's hard work. Um, um, so I want to say that it requires quite a bit of habituation to actually accomplish what it is that the liturgy seems to be calling forth. Um, how much by way of presuppositions of Eastern theological commitments is required? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, they're there in the background. Um, Eastern Christians tend to think of salvation not as a you know, one-off state, as a process type thing. And, uh, that, that, would make, that would make sense of what's going on here. You're working out your salvation in the context of the liturgy. Um, but that's, that's another good question. So my, my short answer is that <laughs> a lot of habituations, hard work. Um, although when I speak with some of my Jewish friends who go to services, <laughs> they're, they're even longer. So <laughs> I kind of feel like <laughs> we're getting off easy. <laughs> Doug. Oh, thanks. Uh, I want to say great stuff. You might be right about these things. Um, <laughs> almost, you have persuaded me. Um, I'm not sure about some things. I don't know if I understand uh, parts of this. Because these speech acts, as you, ref as you refer to them, for example, on page three, they're complex. Yeah. They're very complex things. But most of your presentation focus on elements of them that have to do with like the states of the person, okay. acknowledging these states of, of the person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear as much about the other part where it's now given this is my state, here's how I address God. Um, so um, under indexical appropriation, especially the second one, like the thief, yeah. okay, so now I, I regard myself as a thief. Yeah. But, so the but then, like the thief, uh -huh. I cry out. Yeah. So the likeness to the thief is going to include not just being the thief, but being one who cries out. relates to God yeah. Yeah, and cries yeah, yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Now, you probably don't have a problem accommodating that. Yeah. Yeah. But I just wondered if, if that's an oversight or sort of set aside for, you know, intentionally for the purposes of your paper. It, Going back to the point that these are singular speech apps yeah, yeah. with complexity. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so uh, I think what I want to say here is that um, when we talk about similarities and likenesses, we can talk about all sorts of dimensions of similarity and likeness and pick out some rather than others. So I think you're right to insist that part of the similarity in question is the crying out, or the act of repentance, or the acknowledgement of being in big trouble, or whatever it might be. Um, so yes, I want to take that on. I, and if I uh, overlooked it in my presentation, uh, I certainly didn't intend to do so. I think that's a very important part. Now these are cases where the conti conditions are pretty miserable. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are there, would you say that you could also find counterparts to those where the states in question are more positive, um, where virtues that the self, of the self are acknowledged or reflected in the uh, narrative? That's a good question. Uh, so these are part, as I pointed out uh, at the outset of the talk, these are part of the Lenten liturgies, yeah. which are extremely penitential. Um, so Mike at one point was talking about sort of the self-abasing character of some of the, the Christian writings. Uh, I, I read this as part and parcel of what goes on in a lot of this literature and that it's a very healthy use of hyperbole. <laughs> um, the scriptural narrative has no problems with hyperbole. The liturgical texts have no problems with hyperbole. So, um, uh, so I take some of this to be hyperbolic language. Um, now I'm thinking of cases in which um, there is anything like this that goes on in which we're identifying with positive or virtue traits. And nothing is springing to mind, which is kind of interesting. Um, I, need to, I need to explore that a bit more. Um, when the positive stuff goes on, it's usually directed towards, towards God in the, in the, in the script, uh, not about us. Uh, but it's a very interesting question, why there would be that asymmetry. Correct. Oh, yeah. Um, so just two quick things. One was I thought another contrast with the uh, play acting would be like when you read novels, you empathize with the characters. So yeah. I just thought that was another, like another contrast that we were talking about, the way you relate to, to your, since you use the first person, it's really different than empathizing. Yeah. Um, the other thing I started to wonder about is like what kind of role the this stuff you're talking about could lead to the relationships to the other people in your community. Right. So I guess just sort of like a kind of worry about that would be, you know, if I'm going through this process and I'm realizing, oh, the sense in which I'm a thief and all these other, you know, features of me that are, I sort of hide beneath my pleasant social veneer, uh -huh. that's going to just remind me when I see, like, you know, this guy next to me saying, you know, I'm a thief. Uh -huh. And then, like, of course, we're all very nice bourgeois Americans. We're all very nice to each other. It's just show, it, re it just reinforces the sense in which I don't know these people around me. Plus, they have deep, dark secrets that I don't, they're hiding from me and from uh -huh. themselves. And we're not in a community. I don't know, so I'm just kind of like, 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 you know, maybe that's one of these things, like, people were saying you need to bring in the, the stuff about God and relationship to God, I'm wondering maybe that's one reason you need to do it, to explain how a communal aspect arises, I don't know, that's, yeah, yeah. just that worry arose in my mind. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that might be another case of moral risk here that's involved in um, undertaking this sort of activity. Uh, one thing that I will say is that I don't know, when you participate in these Lenten liturgies, it's pretty hard to sort of, um, how to put this, present oneself as a uh, dignified middle class American, in as much as, you know, a lot of times you're just, you know, I, I prostrated during the liturgy and you're prostrating in front of other people and kissing stuff. You know, it's, it's not, you're not on your living room behavior here. This is, this is, like, this connects with your, your question too. It takes a lot of habituation to get used to this sort of behavior which is really out of keeping with our ordinary behavior. So, you know, when I f find the president of IBM face down next to me, um, my first thought isn't, well, I'm not so sure that he really means it, you know. I, and for me, it's something like, no, there's, there's something, something unifying about this. Even this guy is on his face and I'm on my face, you know, that, that sort of thing. Any, anyway, that's my, that's my sort of reaction to it, although I recognize there might be a darker side to it. <laughs> but let's put it this way, I'll, I'll rely on the normative stuff again. That's not what the liturgical script is calling for. <laughs> All right, we'll have time for only about two more questions, Mike and then Rebecca, and then we'll call it. So I guess my question is related, but what's, this is more just a curiosity about extending it. So in, in the tradition, what's the role, especially the penitential things, with this idea of Surrounding of theosis, right? Yeah. And so, just on the surface, it's kind of puzzling that in order to become God or more like God, uh -huh. I identify with the product, right? I mean, so I identify with this sort of with the prodigal or with the, the vicious in some sense. Yeah, yeah. But then, so yeah, what, I guess I'm just curious. What's the? Yeah. How does that work? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, and maybe it brings out a kind of a cool tension here within the, the tradition that is something like, yeah, 
the ultimate aim is is becoming godlike or whatever. And so you're you're in in a sense trying to incorporate your life into the life of God. But at the same time, you're identifying with these unsavories. Uh, that's kind of that's that's I like tensions in in religious life, and I kind of like that tension. <laughs> so you just sort of just to live it. Yeah, I mean maybe the thought is that's part and parcel of the activity. That would be that would be kind of neat. Um, so like I say, I'm, 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 I'm happy with these creative tensions within the tradition, but that, that's a very interesting question. Rebecca, you've been waiting to get in. Yeah, thanks for this paper, Terrence. I want to go back to the grammar, um, the first person um, language. Yeah. I, I'm just going to ask you to compare your project uh, um, to the kind of work Eleanor Stump's been doing and second person accounts. Yeah. So here's my thought. Um, the way you set things up is you you, you put your own, uh, you put these, this first person account in your own mouth uh, in the liturgy yeah. in order to construct a narrative identity. Yeah. But what I haven't heard yet is anything about the, I mean, and, and you gesture to this in your answers to other questions, but <coughs> the relational telos and uh, of all of that new narrative construction. So yeah. the idea isn't just my own deification, but the way that my own sanctification or whatnot, or my own identification with these characters, puts me face to face with God in a second personal account, shared joint attention sort of way, in a way that facilitates a closeness in the relationship, a kind of directness in my relationship to God that I can't get through, say, hearing a narrative about Adam being created, or hearing a story about Mary of Bethany wiping Jesus' feet with her. Okay, yeah, another that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if that's a direction you've thought about, if that's another yeah. one of these dominant ends you haven't time to stick on the handout. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, so, right, this is in the neighborhood of some of these other comments. It's a really I interesting twist on, 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 on that observation. So, so I'm inclined to say maybe something like this. If you buy into the narrative, um, there's something uh, important and helpful about the prodigal's reaction, about the thief's reaction, about Mary of Bethany's reaction, that puts these people in a good place vis-a-vis -vis God, right? So maybe one way to think about it is something like, by putting yourself, identifying with these characters, you put yourself in a good place with respect to God. And this, so the second personal thing has a better chance of getting off the ground. Or, so, 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 so maybe that's the way to begin thinking about how, how that works um, in, in the context of, of the liturgy. Um, something I need to think more about. Um, interesting question. All right, at this point, I think we need to call it quits, but thanks, please join me.